Hello and welcome everybody. So incredibly excited about the presentation today. This is such a big topic and impacts so many of us. I have had the privilege of knowing and collaborating with Cindy for several years now. And I'm really excited about what she's doing and what she's got available in terms of supporting people working with those who have ADHD. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Cindy. I will let all of you know, yes, you're going to get an email afterwards. Yes, the recording is going to be on YouTube, so you can get it again. Cindy will have information, and you'll have how to contact her. So welcome, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I just have to say, you know, Kathy, I love the work that you do. That's why we collaborate together. And I always hear such great things about your trainings from the coaches that come over to me for your training. So I'm so glad to be seeing this audience here. So thank you. Um, and I actually recognize a few names. So that's awesome. So welcome, everybody. Um, we are going to be talking about parenting um, children, teens with ADHD. We're going to be talking about it from the level of kind of why the parents really need their own support and maybe a little bit about coaching parents, if that's something obviously I'm sure some of you have an interest in as well. I'm gonna ask you guys as much as possible. I'd love to see your faces because I'm all about connection. I wanna be able to you know, see how you're responding to some of the information. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them during the presentation. You don't have to wait until the end. I may not see your hand going up. If I do, of course, I'll just call on you. If you want to just speak into the space, that's great, or put something in the chat. I know that Kathy and her team are monitoring the chat. So lots of yeah, different ways. I'll monitor the chat. And just to let all of you know, yes, we're recording. The recording goes on YouTube. So just know that when you're choosing to be on camera. Sorry, Cindy, I got to give that disclaimer there. Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I also do want to tell you all a little bit about myself because I'm always curious to know who's talking to me. I am a mental health counselor and I'm also an ADHD coach. I am the creator of Common Connected. It's a parent workshop series I've been doing for 15 years now. It is actually offered by coaches nationwide and actually in some other countries as well. It's in Chinese, it's in Japanese, it's in Arabic now. Um, always happy to have it translated into other languages because the need worldwide for support for these kids is so great. Not just support, but just understanding, awareness, everything else. Um, you see, I have two books there. The first book that I wrote is really geared toward parents. It's called The Eight Keys to Parenting Children with ADHD. The second book is co-authored by my daughter who's a special education teacher and it's meant for classroom teachers, but also therapists and just really anyone who works with kids. Um, so you may want to check that out. So that's enough about me. Um, like I said, I'm just so thrilled to have all of you. So we are going to get started with our presentation, which is about these kids, kids with ADHD, kids with executive function challenges. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to have a sip of water. My voice just got raspy. What I have found through the years, when I originally started working with, with um, kids, I was originally trained as a coach to work with high school and college kids, and also with younger kids, I found that, you know what? When the parents don't know what the parents don't know, when they don't understand the experience of their child, I wasn't always getting as far as I need to with the kids. And that's when I decided I was gonna put the parent at the center of my work. And that's what I've been doing all of these years. I've been coaching parents. And now, of course, I train other professionals to become parent coaches. I also go into school districts. I do teacher training. Why? Because after I worked with all the parents, the parents said, well, I'm going into the school and I'm telling them all the things I'm learning. And the teacher doesn't really know what, what I know now, right? So I also do go into schools and do teacher training. And this year I will be rolling out my train the trainer program where you, you know, people will be able to um, be trained to train, to coach the, um, the teachers. Um, so the first question is that I usually get from parents, 
is how can I get my kid to, and fill in lots of blanks here, be more organized, manage his time, be more motivated, socialize better, be more compliant, try harder, stop having meltdowns, just be easier. Any of you out there as parents, because I know many of you probably are parents of these kids, feel like, yeah, that's what I want to know, right? Well, here's the thing. I know as a coach, when a parent calls and says that to me, that's already a red flag because I can't get your kid to do anything. I can coach them. I can coach you so that they can learn a lot of these tools and strategies and start to make a lot of really significant and wonderful shifts. But I don't have any magic bullet any more than anyone else does. It's going to be through our coaching process. So when do you think parents first reach out for help, right? Anyone want to tell me, when, when do you think parents first reach out for help? And if anyone wants to either write it in the chat, I'll probably see that. Or if you want to just tell me, at what point do you think parents reach out for their help? When it's too late. <laughs> when it's too late. <laughs> Yeah, I noticed that in the thing too. Yeah. What does that mean though when it's too late? What does that feel like? We just haven't set a foundation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When it feels like maybe things are out of control, we're feeling stressed. I see, I see people writing when they're overwhelmed, when they're frustrated. Um, I reached out upon diagnosis, right? Here's what I would say. Here, here are a lot of the times that I get the phone calls. We have my kids just bouncing off the wall. I can't get them to sit still. I can't get them to do anything. I can't get them to listen. We've got the, oh, he's so disorganized. She can't find anything. She's always late. She's always, you know, it's just overwhelming. Or we just fight all the time. I don't want to fight with my kid, but I can't get him to do anything. It seems like the only time he'll do something is if I yell and I don't want to yell. Or we've got, he's just not motivated. I just can't get him to do his work, right? Or she's just, or he's just so anxious or depressed and depleted, right? There's so much of that out there. The question is, who do parents reach out to? Well, they really reach out to a whole variety of people, but let's see what happens when they do. A lot of parents, first people they reach out to is their family and friends. What's the concern here? Well, family and friends are not necessarily experts and they may be very well-meaning, but if they're not in your house all the time, and maybe some of them are, they don't necessarily see not just your child's challenges, but the efforts the parents are putting forth. Um, they don't necessarily have all the latest information on what does all of this mean and, and how do we work with kids. Then we've got the teachers, the guidance counselors. Now, as I mentioned, my daughter's a, a teacher. I have the ultimate respect for teachers, especially this past two years, all of they've been going through. Um, with teaching kids online and everything else. But the fact is, teachers are not trained in ADHD and executive function unless one of two things has happened. They have reached out independently to get some training or their school has brought someone like me in to do a specific training. But if you ask most teachers when they were learning how to be a teacher, did they learn more than maybe a chapter in a book or, or a quick lecture on ADHD or executive function, chances are they have not, right? I see someone wrote, or they're a special educator. I will tell you, Michael, and it depends on where they go to school and everything else. My daughter went to an amazing college. She knew she was going to be a special educator from freshman year. So her whole curriculum was around special education. I had her sit through my full day training after she graduates, she said, Ma, I didn't learn all these things. So they're still, you know, even the special educators are not, because they have so much they need to learn, laws, everything else. So they're still not getting as in-depth knowledge as they need to, unfortunately. Then, of course, we have 
the pediatricians. Now, many people, I noticed someone said when I got a diagnosis, many people will go to the pediatrician and say, listen, my kid's really acting out. I'm having a lot of trouble at home and everything else. And to this day, I still hear this. I'm not saying all pediatricians. Pediatrician might say, well, it sounds like it might be ADHD, fill this out, whatever. Here's a script for Ritalin or something else. That's not a diagnosis. That is a hypothesis. A diagnosis is much more involved than that. I'm not gonna to go too far into the diagnosis, but basically you need a full family history. You need an observation in two or more settings. Um, you need to rule out certain things that may mimic ADHD, such as a thyroid condition or sleep apnea or severe food allergies or Crohn's, lots of things. And then of course there were the coexisting conditions, right? That may exacerbate things. We need to really do a deep dive, you know, whether it's depression or anxiety or, or um, you know, processing disorder or any of these things. So we have to really make sure that the person that is giving us our information is an expert in this field, right? Then we have um, internet. That's a scary one, right? A lot of people stay up. I, I can't tell you how many emails I get. And I can see when the person emailed me, it's somewhere between the hours of 1 and 4 a.m. Why? Because that's the only time the parent has to breathe and they're so anxious and that's what they're doing. They're Googling, right? But the thing is, we know that Google's not always going to be that reliable and it can be scary. So the question is, how accurate and appropriate is all of that knowledge that they're acquiring? So now let's look at some of the common interventions, right? When a child is diagnosed with ADHD or we're even red flagging them and by red flagging them, what I mean is, gee, I don't know, it doesn't feel like typical behavior. I'm not ready to go for a diagnosis or, or the diagnosis was so preliminary. I call that being red flagged. In other words, we wanna keep an eye on this kid and see how things are gonna progress. Okay, so one of the common interventions, well, school may start a plan. Now this could be a formal plan, like an IEP or a 504 plan. If you're not familiar, I'll just tell you very basically, an IEP would be an individualized education program where the child is receiving direct services in, um, in school, whether it's resource room or occupational therapy or speech, you know, any of those things. Or a 504 plan would be where they're receiving accommodations and or modifications, which of course might also be part of their IEP plan. So the school may start a plan, but the reason I put that in quotes is especially in elementary school, sometimes this plan is just the teacher says, okay, you know what, I'm gonna work with Johnny a little bit. But then if you transfer to another school, or you go up the next year in the next grade, that plan is not necessarily in place and the parent is starting all over again. Medication, um, this is my, my two second thing on medication. I do not diagnose, I do not medicate. My job is education and support. I do help parents understand medication, the impact and everything else. Um, it's very complex, it's a very private decision. I always tell parents, of course I'll work with you. If you don't medicate your child, I'll work with you either way. But there are so many issues with medication that parents need help working through. What do I do if my kid has no appetite all day? And then at the end of the day, he's starving. What do I do with my older kid that you know he needs to really study at night and the med is worn off and I don't wanna give him another med because now he's not gonna eat and he's not gonna sleep. So there's all these parenting issues that get involved in the medication piece. Family and friends are gonna suggest different parenting approaches. Well, I kind of put that in that category from the other slide. Parents don't necessarily know any better. Therapy, here's my thing about therapy. I think therapy is wonderful with the right therapist and for the right reason. 
ADHD is a neurobiological condition. What does that mean? It means you are born with it. It means your brain works differently. Anyone who's ever worked with me or read any of my material know that I do not look at this as a disorder. I look at it as a difference with challenges. If it was just a disorder, there's such a large percentage of our population that deals with ADHD, right? So especially when you're dealing with children, you don't necessarily want them to feel like there's something wrong with them. I like the analogy that Ned Halliwell uses. You've got an amazing brain. The problem is you've got bicycle brakes. We have to work on how to kind of shift and move and, and work your brain, right? And that's where the coaching comes in. Um, one other thing I want to say about therapists, and again, you know, that's my background as well. I put out a blog on my website a while back called In Search of ADHD Therapists because I get so many requests for, you know, for therapists. And I know that many therapists, just like educators, have not been trained in ADHD. And I ask therapists to send me their information if they are truly trained in the world of ADHD. And I ask them, how are they trained? And I'm sorry to say that the majority of them said, oh, I've got ADHD myself or my kids have ADHD. That's not training, that's experience. And that experience is not necessarily transferable to the next individual. If you've met one person with ADHD, you've met one person with ADHD. It's gonna show up differently for every kid and every adult, by the way, right? Um, alternative treatments that may or may not have scientific background. So what I mean by that is I see things, and I'm not going to name certain brand names, but there are lots of treatments out there that say, we can cure your kid's ADHD. We can modify. You have to look at the research. You have to make sure that they are not um, teaching to the test, so to speak, and that their sample size is large enough. So I always say, buyer beware. But here's the caveat. A lot of parents will say, well, you know, I'm still willing to try it because I don't want to try meds, right? Or, or whatever other reason. The thing is that when you are trying some of these alternatives, we are raising the hope of the child and the parent. And if it doesn't work and you keep trying some of these things that aren't working, Sometimes, unfortunately, the child gets to have the feeling like, boy, I must be so broken. Not, none of these things are working for me. They seem to work for other people. So that's why I'm not a fan of what's the, what's the downside of just trying. Does that make sense? I'm going to pause for a moment because I, I haven't read any of the chat. Kathy, is there anything you want to read out loud or share a little bit? You know what the theme I'm seeing in the chat seems to be is challenges in dealing with the school system as far as supporting the child mm -hmm. so yeah whatever yeah. tips or hints you can give there is going to be helpful i'm not sure if you want to do it here or if you have something else planned coming up um why don't i do it here since you brought it up um listen this is why i go into school districts and do teacher training because unfortunately until the teacher understands the social and emotional impact that ADHD and executive function challenges have on learning, motivation, and behavior, then the typical tips and tools aren't working for them. So that's why parents need to be able to um, kind of educate the teachers in a certain way. And that's a, a thorny subject, right? That's why sometimes I or my coaches, and when I say my coaches, I have trained um, parent coaches that work with me. So. Um, they do the coaching as well. Sometimes we will go into the school, not as an advocate, not as a paid advocate. We're not doing it from the legal standpoint that you need to give Johnny these services. We're doing it from the educational standpoint of this is what's going on for him. This is what might help. Can I brainstorm with you, teacher, and see you know, what we can do so that maybe we're going to write it into the accommodations or modifications. Maybe we're going to you know, beef up the IEP plan, but that's a lot of what happens, 
right? So yeah, and stay tuned. As I said, I will be doing, you know, train the trainer thing. So if that's something that you really feel passionate about, definitely be in touch with me because that's a big issue. Was there, was there another piece of that that I missed, Kathy? Yeah, it really, it sounds like it's just tips how to get the school to, like uh, one of the comments was a progressive discipline plan was all they'd do. So it's, I, am not it, I think it's back to what you were saying. The teachers aren't trained. The therapists aren't trained. They don't know what they're dealing with or how to deal with it. Exactly, exactly. And, and that's, you know, one of the things I, I help the teachers understand because, you know, the first two hours of the training, and it's interesting, I'll just digress for just a moment. I'm doing a training um, virtual in South Korea on Sunday night at 930 at night because it's different time zone there. But um, the, you know, I had sent her the PowerPoint just so she could print it up for her teachers and she looked it over and she said, yeah, but the teachers really want tools and strategies. And I said, yeah, we're going to get to that, you know, a little later on. But if they don't understand what it's like to be that child, you could just Google what are the tips and tools and strategies on helping a kid focus and helping a kid not yell out. If those things were working, they'd be working. The reason they're not working is because we need to understand more deeply so that the teachers and the parents can dance in the moment so that they can modify those tools and strategies that they're learning for that particular child. So I would say to any of the people out there, um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I can do some brainstorming with you, you know, on particular cases, if you wanna have sessions or whatever, um, happy, to, happy to follow up with you with more detailed information on that, on how to, how to work with your teachers. Um, the other one that's come in since is also, what if the other parent is not on board with this? That comes up a lot. That comes up a lot. Um, what I will say is this, I work with the person in front of me. I meet them where they are. I'm gonna help them parent in such a way that they're not then lecturing the other parent, but they're modeling and demonstrating. And I believe, and I've seen creating those important shifts in the dynamics of the home and the relationship that they're having with the child that they're then able to either bring that parent in or have that parent say, oh, okay, you know, we need to get together on this. One of the other things that I do when I teach, especially in the Common Connected Workshop series that I mentioned at the very beginning, the centerpiece of that is how to collaborate. And it's not just collaborating with your child, it's collaborating with your partner. So I always tell parents, I don't do couples therapy, but I do do couples coaching. I'm gonna help you guys get on the same page on some of these major issues so that you're parenting from the same place because there's nothing more detrimental to a child than when the parents are not parenting the same way, even if they love each other and have a wonderful intact relationship. So, all right, well, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna move forward on this and I'll- <laughs> Okay, I was gonna say another really good question came in. Yes, go, 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 go ahead. So how can we help our kids handle friends at school that get irritated by them? You know what? That's part of the work that we do in the parent coaching. We are gonna help the kids. Advocacy is a developmental skill. It can't be an expectation. So we have to really think about the expectation we have of our child in terms of doing that. So yes, part of the work we do as parent coaches is help our parents, help our kids learn how to speak for themselves, learn how to handle those thorny things. So I can't give you a quick answer because, and this will make sense to some of you, I, I see some of my coaches out there, parent the child you have is our tagline. Every child is different. Every situation is different. So I can't give you the exact answer on how to help that kid because I need to know what is he dealing with? What has he tried? How is it, right? I need to know so much more. But when I do, I definitely can help with that. All right, so in terms of these common interventions that go on, you can imagine a lot of this might be a lot of time that may be wasted. So that's why I always say the most important intervention for the child is for the parent to get education support. That's the most important education piece. But I do still get a lot of parents reaching out and say, will you just coach my kid, right? 
Well, one of the questions we think about is, is the child ready for coaching? Does this child want to make changes in how and what he does? The thing I say to parents, well, I'll go on with this and then I'll tell you what I say to parents very often. Is the student willing to partner with a coach? Is the student ready to do the coaching work? Because it is work. Coaching is not therapy. Coaching requires of the, of the client that they are a partner in this process, which means they're gonna have their work to do. Is the student capable of working effectively with the coach? And is the student struggling with mental health issues that might impede the coaching process? I always think it's important that we have our team, right? So coaching does not replace therapy, it can support therapy. It is two different things. But as I always say to parents, when they call me and they say, you know, I want my kid to be coached. I think he needs this, this, and this. I know my coaches because I have coaches who work with parents and I have coaches who work with the predominantly the high school and the college kids and the adults, by the way, because a lot of adults do need coaching, um, which I think is great. And of course, I know that, <laughs> you know, that you're all, co you know, in the coaching world, but um, but what I say is on a scale of one to 10, if you told your kid, hey, you know what? I found a coach for you, Johnny. She's gonna be able to help you figure out why you're having a hard time getting started and why you're having a hard time managing your materials and you get so frustrated and you can't speak to people and you can't manage this and all those things that scale of one to 10, 10 being, wow, mom, dad, that's great, sign me up. One being, Ma, if you would just get off my back, just leave me alone, I got this right? I just have to try harder. I just have to do this. Where is your kid on that scale? Now, a lot of parents will say, oh, he's, he's definitely a 10. He really, he wants me off his back. He's right. Not so sure. But a lot of parents recognize, oh no, my kid doesn't want that. And that's again, why I reinforce that the most important thing is going to be the parent coaching. Whether the kid is five years old, 15 years old, or 25 years old, I have a lot of parents come to me because their kids are not launched, right? So how do I deal with that older child? What kind of expectations do I put on them financially? You know, helping around the house, all those things. These are all things that we deal with. So why do typical parenting strategies often fall short? Well, parents often rely on logic, intuition, advice from others. Parents often don't recognize how their own communication habits and preferences and styles and expectations can unknowingly exacerbate the problem that they're having with their child. I'll give you an example. Um, those of you who know anything about executive function, and I'm not assuming all of you do, so I'll explain real briefly. The executive function system is the front part of your brain. If you look at your, your hand and you say, that's your brain, this is the back of the brain where the reptilian part of the brain is. That's the primitive part of the brain. The brain develops from the back of the brain to the front of the brain. The front of the brain is where your executive function system is. So that's the last part of the brain to develop. In that executive function system, that's how we do what we intend to do. So it has to do with organizing, planning, time management, emotional regulation, all of these things. There's nothing to do with your intelligence level has to do with your action. So one of the executive functions that really gets a lot of these kids in trouble is working memory. Working memory may be weaker for many people, especially kids with ADHD and adults, by the way, it doesn't always change. That's that ability, your working memory is, think about doing long division, right? You have to think about what are the steps? What's the information I have in front of me? How do I integrate it? You need it for conversations. Or how about this? Hey, Johnny, do me a favor, go upstairs, get your backpack, your shoes, your tennis racket on the way down. Could you see if I turn my light off and, and get my book? And what's the emotion? Maybe you guys can just put it in the chat. What's the emotion some of you are feeling right now when, when your kids don't come down or that you imagine goes on for the parent? Anyone feel an emotion when I say, could you do that? Impatience, yep. What else? How else is the parent feeling in that moment when the kid comes down with maybe one thing? I was, right? thinking, I was thinking how overwhelming for the child. <laughs> <laughs> that 
that's a whole bunch of instructions. It's like, that's way too much. But the parent is just like, okay, just did, and, and the other day he did it fine, or I really need, right? And it's, I see, I love that word, pre-disappointment, right? Because you know, it's not going to happen. Parents get agitated, frustrated, exhausted. Why isn't my kid listening? He's defiant, he's difficult. But when we talk about educating parents about working memory, that working memory is a thing and that your child may have a weaker working memory, not to mention stress and everything else and it was too many directions. Oh, now I can go into problem solving. So automatically we're starting to slow things down, right? That's why we need to help parents just understand. And that's just one, one little piece. When I teach about ADHD and executive function in the Common Connected Workshop series, it's a two hour deep dive. It's not just a quick explanation, right? So here, John, if you just hurry up and pay attention to what you're doing, you can go out and play with your friends. Rachel, do you want the red one or the green one? Hurry up, we gotta go, we gotta leave the store. Not realizing that they're adding stress and they're reducing the ability of the child to respond. So parents need to know the social and emotional impact that ADHD and executive function challenges have on learning, motivation, behavior, and on the whole family system. Because parents wonder, am I enabling my child or supporting my child every time I try to help? What kind of boundaries should I be setting that aren't triggering and they're actually allowing growth? And what kind of consequences can I set that are gonna build skills and not just be punitive? And how do I help my child express their thoughts and their concerns and their feelings to me so I can be the most supportive? These are the things that parents wonder about. I see someone wrote in, I'm constantly second guessing myself, of course, because these are complex things. Parenting is hard, period. Parenting a complex child is even harder. And in a little COVID and everything else, forget it. <laughs> Right? So we need support. I see someone run, I feel like I failed her when I show frustration. Here's what I wanna let you know. First of all, the arc is long. You didn't fail her. You have so many opportunities to say, hey, you know what? I'm not sure I like how I handled that situation. I'm working on this. I wanna get better at this. Maybe you and I can do this together, right? That's the message. It's all about the empathy and the understanding and the intention, and then getting the specific education and tools and strategies, which is why the greatest impact that parents and teachers can have on children with ADHD is to help them understand what's truly getting in the way of meeting their goals and providing them with the knowledge, the tools, and the strategies to succeed in home, in school, socially, in life. So parent coaching is considered the gold standard of treatment of child behavior problems. That's why when I hear things, I think someone mentioned at the beginning, you know, the, the sticker charts or the reward programs that schools have, those things can shut kids down. They are just not going to work. But who do they work for? The kids that don't have these challenges, right? And yes, it goes for kids with ADHD and not ADHD. Absolutely. But that's why I educate parents on the science of rewards and punishments. We need to understand because there are times that dangling that carrot can work, but we need to know what that is. And we need to know our specific child and how to incorporate working with them in implementing those things, right? So the goals of parent coaching. Well, wouldn't it be great to just reduce the stress? And it does, it really reduces the stress. It helps parents establish effective and appropriate rules and expectations and boundaries. It teaches parents effective communication skills to use with each other and with their children. Notice I kind of tied in that bit about like, how do we, how do we parent together, right? Teach parents effective discipline strategies and improve awareness of enabling versus supporting. Setting boundaries is important. How we do it and what we do it on, we need to really tweak. 
And we need to support parents with tools and insights to help their children learn self-regulation. Self-regulation is that, that emotional self-regulation. Anyone know anyone, themselves or otherwise, who goes zero to 100, like as soon as something gets emotionally active, right? Yeah, but I'm gonna see a lot of, yep, 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 right? That's emotional regulation. I always say, this is your child's beautiful face. Here are all their emotions back here. Their emotions spill out. We need to help them learn how to pause and regulate themselves so that they are speaking in a way that's gonna help them and help the person they're communicating to hear their communication. A few added benefits of parent coaching. Parents who have received parent coaching are more effective in collaborating with their teachers, therapeutic providers, and I would say the teachers as well, right? They're more able to participate in discussions regarding the impact and the effectiveness of medication, and they're more effective advocates for their children in school and in life, right? Here are a few parents' comments, and I get these all the time. I understand my child so much more. As a result, I have so much more patience. My anxiety level was lower all week. I realized I needed to be more patient. The reason I keep that one in there is, of course, we objectively know we need to have patience, but we focus so much on the child and what the child needs to do. We need to see ourselves. I see that he really does want to do good. I feel less guilty and more optimistic. My teenager actually thanked me and wants to spend more time with me. Isn't that awesome? So I'm gonna show you something called the parenting wheel of life. Oops. Now I know as coaches, I'm sure many of you use the, parent, the, the wheel of life, um, but I wanna show you specifically how I use it sometimes in parenting. What is the role of the parent? And of course, I would, if I was working with a parent, I may have them fill it out themselves, but these are some of the typical things I see. Tour guide to the world. I wanna be their academic coach, their career coach, their playmate, their friend, their self-care coach, their life skills coach, right? These are so many of the different areas. How successful is the parent feeling in each of these areas? Where do they feel they wanna make some changes? Where do they feel they wanna grow, right? Another way of looking at this, and this is actually based on my Common Connected Workshop series, clear rules and expectations, effective consequences, parental consistency, connected relationships, effective communication style, and it all starts with a calm home. That's where it's all got to start. So we want to look at how bumpy is your ride. And I always say to parents, if it's feeling pretty bumpy, that's what we're here for, right? This is just to show you, this is that Common Connected Workshop series I mentioned. Those of you, if you decide you want to train to become a parent coach, you will be a licensed provider of the Common Connected Workshop series, which means you will be able to give my workshop series yourself. It's a seven session workshop series. I tell parents you can take just session one. In fact, I have tons of therapists and doctors and whatnot um, who always, you know, when they do a diagnosis, they will refer, take session one of Common Connected. And then if they want, they can take the rest of the series. So session one is what you see on the right. And the full series is what you see on the left. Okay. And if you want information about this, you can read, you know, you can look right on my website. My last slide that I'm about to show you is going to have my website and all of my information in case you want to contact me. I just want to show you my next training is going to be June 7th. That's the, um, if those of you, if you're interested in training to become a parent coach, um, if you are interested just as a parent to take the parent coaching workshop, the common connected workshop that I mentioned. Um, one of my coaches will be running that February 22nd. I have additional dates coming up in March and you know ongoing, but I don't have those dates yet. 
so that you'll have to look at the website. I do also have some free presentations coming up that you can see. One is ready, set, and how do I get started? Because how many of you out there have kids and you're like, I can't get him to start his work, right? So that's going to be, yeah, I see a lot of the hands going up. So that's going to be um, helpful for you there. And goal setting. I think it's really important that we help kids set goals. We know that for our own selves, for adults, when we set goals and as coaches, I know you know this, when you set goals and set action steps and have an actual plan, it's going to reduce your stress and anxiety and of course, increase your productivity. So that's, I'm gonna leave that up there for you. Um, I wanna just open the floor to discussion. Kathy, you can monitor, of course, the chat, but if you guys wanna take yourselves off mute and just ask your questions, whatever you'd like to do, I'm happy to accommodate. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, one of the interesting things I was noticing in the chat box, and I'm I'm just sharing this while everyone's thinking about their questions and getting them in there, is sometimes people are being hard on themselves because they didn't know what they didn't know or whatever happened. And to me, it's, okay, so how can they give themselves grace, Cindy, and, and know that, of course, we all make mistakes, and what do I want to do now? So I don't know if you can see it with my virtual screen up there. I'm going to assume you can't see it. But the back of my phone, it says, start from wherever you are and with whatever you've got. That's a famous quote by Jim Rohn. And that's it. You may have made mistakes. Things aren't where you want them to be. What you pay attention to grows. Do you want to be looking back there and feeling down? Or do you want to look at what your opportunities are and what you can do? You're showing up. That's the first step. Yeah. Nice. Nice. So anyone want to, I know Kathy's going to look at the. Yeah, I'm the, watching the chat box and looking for questions. A lot of sharing going on there. Uh, let's, let's invite specific questions. What do you want to ask Cindy while we've got this amazing expertise available to us? I have a question. Sure. Um, I mean, it, it's kind of about multiple. I feel like my daughter has multiple diagnoses or just lots of things that could possibly be going on, including ADHD and, you know, kind of how, I guess how I look at it is like, like they're just all these different behaviors. And I guess, I don't know what my specific question is, but I'm wondering if like this, it seems like your parent coaching would probably address a lot of different things potentially, or so I, I can address that question because I, I, I really, I hear what you're, you're trying to ask. It's like, is it just about ADHD? Is it this other stuff going on, right? Um, most parents will tell you that have taken my class, this helped with my whole family, not just that child with ADHD. It's parenting skills. It's ramped up parenting skills. Because if you know how to parent a kid with emotional dysregulation, you're going to be able to you know, spread that around to a lot of other things. Does that make sense? So absolutely. Thank and you. And yeah, have a question, you know, take session one and then you could decide if you want the rest. But in session one, you're going to get that full education, not just about ADHD, but about executive function. And we all have executive function, right? I'm signed up. <laughs> okay. I'm already yeah. signed up. Thank you. That's awesome. So Cindy, a couple of people have questions in terms of meltdowns. So let me uh, hopefully sum it up. Uh, how do you prevent a meltdown? And then if there is a meltdown, how do you deal with it? Best question, hardest answer. You ready? And I don't want to frustrate anyone with this answer. It depends. <laughs> that's why, well, and that's why I say parent the child you have, right? But here are some basic things I can tell you. Without calm, and I know some of my coaches are out there right now saying, there is no learning. That's what I drill home with everyone. Without calm, there is no learning. What does that mean? In the moments of these stress, do the best you can. Just do the best you can. But two days later, five days before you ne the next whatever, that's when your really good work is going to be. And that's where we're going to give you all the tools and strategies to have the conversations, do the plans, give them the, the tools, all of that. 
Because in that moment, remember I said the executive function, back of the brain, front of the brain? In that moment of stress, they're in the back of the brain. That's the reptilian part of the brain. What happens to the brain when we're stressed out? Fight, flight, freeze. And guess what? There's a fourth F. Fib. Why do good kids sometimes lie? Because they're good kids. Because they can't handle anything else that's coming at them. They don't want to tell you, yes, I really do have homework, but I, I, I can't do it because I, I got so confused. And if I tell the teacher, she gets upset with me, or you're going to say go to extra help and I can't go there. And, and so I'm just going to say I have no homework. We want to help kids have the coping skills to deal with that feeling and to deal with all of that. So that's why I say the work has to be done proactively. What do you do in the moment? In the moment, hopefully you can have some of these tools and strategies to be able to work with them. But sometimes the best thing you could do is just kind of sit down with them and just be empathetic and say, yeah, seems like this is really hard. We'll figure it out. Maybe let's just go for a walk around the block and just, just not even talk about it. And, or how about I'll go get a snack and you go get a short game and let's just kind of calm down and then we'll figure out what's going on because that's what they need. Yeah. Nice. Anyway. Uh, yeah. There's also a question in it about uh, when you have siblings and one has ADHD and the other does not. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? Education of the family, not just, oh, Johnny has ADHD, therefore, no, it's not about that. We all have our strengths. We all have our weaknesses. But one of the things I always help parents look out for is, and, and it works both ways, sometimes the child without ADHD, whether they are younger or older, becomes uber responsible, feels like they have to help out with the parenting, even if they're not an invited parent. So they may say, Johnny, stop doing that. You know, you're not supposed to do that. Or, you know, something, something along those lines. And we have to watch out for that sibling because sometimes they push their own needs down because they feel like there's so much going on with Johnny. I, just mine, you know, pales in comparison. I've got to be the good kid that's not taking up more space. Or sometimes they get angry and resentful and really pick on the other kid. And that's when we re really need to say, hey, listen, you know what, kiddo? You've got your challenges too. They just don't have a label but we all need to really work together here. Hope that answers it a little bit. Oh, a little bit there. Um, I know there were a couple of questions earlier about sleep patterns. And so I'm just gonna throw that topic out generically. Sure. So one thing that, again, parents don't necessarily realize, statistically, 25 to 50% of people, not just children, of people with ADHD have trouble with sleep. That means trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, or waking up. It is not just because your kid's trying to drive you crazy, okay? They may have sleep apnea, or they may have ADHD and their brain doesn't settle down as much. So sleep hygiene becomes much more important. What is sleep hygiene? Learning you know, patterns to how to fall asleep and everything else. On my website, if you, in, in the search bar on the upper right, if you put in the word sleep, there are two articles I've written on this. One is why is it so hard to fall asleep? And it's got some tips and tools and strategies there. And the other one is why is it so hard to wake up? And it's got some strategies there. I see someone wrote in their melatonin. Melatonin can be great, but you always want to make sure, even though it's something you can get in the health food store, that you run it by you know, the pediatrician or your doctor, if need be, because you want to make sure how much, you know, it's like, how much is enough? How much is too much when it, all of those things. So it can be very important and very valuable to find out more and not just go grab it off the, off the shelf. Yeah, yeah. And there've been a couple of questions about the parent coach program in terms of how many sessions, and then also if somebody misses a session. Okay. Um, the program is 12 sessions. Each session is two hours. Um, every class is recorded. 
Um, of course, if you miss class, you're required to listen to the class and, and you know, follow up. There is homework after each class. Um, it's not a lot of homework, but it's something that's going to help you do a deeper reflection and help me know that you're learning, you know, what I'm hoping that you're learning. Also, you are paired with a partner so that you can practice some of the things that we're working on and go deeper on it. And, and people love the, the, I'm sure, and the same thing in your, in your coach group, people love the, the cohort that they get to develop through working with the other coaches. And the added benefit, and it's not an intention, there are parents who, I mean, there are people who take the training who are also parents. So we get to use some of the live examples in our parent coaching, you know, workshop. So it's really neat. Awesome. And then somebody was asking about, can they share the recordings with a partner? Can they share the recordings? Yeah, if the class is recorded, is it okay for them to share that with somebody else? Outside of the class? Mm -hmm. No, no, it's, it's meant for the class. Yeah, the person that signs the contract that the purpose of the recordings is is for our own personal our own use. Lives. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and by the way, I never record the Common Connected course for that reason. Even though I do have the parents sign an agreement that everything's private, it's not for people to share. I do have a recorded e course of the Common Connected, um, but there's no parents in that. Okay. Okay. Good. And then, what's the cost of the program? It's thirty-two hundred, and that covers um, also your first year's licensing fee. Remember, I said that you become a licensed provider. You get to use all of the Common Connected materials to run your own workshops, and that's an annual fee, but it's included in the first year's training. Yeah. So I'm curious, Cindy, what's your experience if? one parent takes the class and the other one doesn't? The experience, I wish I could say it's all golden. Um, sometimes it's, it's amazing. I have had that second parent come take the class two years later, like now I get it. Um, sometimes the parent will, that did take the class say, he's really coming on board. He's starting to listen to me now. He's asking me, where, to, where did I learn this? What did I learn that? Sometimes, unfortunately, I do see a lot of stress in the marriage and I end up referring to couples, couples therapy. Oh, that's got to be a challenge. Yeah. So good. I think based on some of the questions I'm seeing in the chat and I have a same question, it looks like some of us are not necessarily looking to become coaches, but just want education from a parental standpoint. So is that still this coaching academy that you're suggesting or is there some other? That would be the Common Connected Workshop Series. That's a seven session workshop series um, directed at parenting. So if you're needing parenting support, you want to take the Common Connected Parenting Children and Teens. It's a seven session workshop series. Each session is about an hour and a half. The first session is two hours. Um, cause that's where we're doing, you know, just the full understanding and that workshop is 490. Um, and each week you get the materials for the class and I always give follow-up materials as well. So there's a lot of support in that workshop. Okay. Thank you. And a lot of questions on sharing with the spouse still. Um, so does the spouse register separately or can they share the registration? Even if parents are divorced and living in separate homes, I only ask them to pay one fee. Okay, so the spouse can attend with them. Spouse can absolutely attend. Awesome. Okay. Even an occasional grandparent, which I have that too, because their grandparents are, are doing the parenting, yep. right? So I'm not, you know, I think 490 for a family is, is enough. I don't look to spread it out. Awesome. That is so wonderful. So yes, I'm watching for more questions. And I actually have a question of everyone here. What is your biggest takeaway from what Cindy has shared with you? And put it in the chat box. Your biggest takeaway from this conversation. Uh, Lisa, it looks like you had a question. 
I have, uh, I don't know if it's another Lisa, but Lisa Shackman, I do have a question. Go ahead. If that's okay. Um, my one question is like, um, I have a child who's uh, like 16, like a teenager. And when you try, when you take a class like this, um, and I saw someone else put in the chat, like, you know, like there are many, especially girls, I think, who get diagnosed later because they don't exhibit some of the same symptoms maybe as boys. Mm -hmm. Is this parenting class helpful? Like, does it differentiate based on the age? Because I'm sure there, there are similar issues, but also different issues as your child is in the teenage years and older, and heading right. towards, you know, young adults. So yeah. is, is, is this appropriate for both? Like, will you feel like, cause my child's not having, I mean, or maybe the tantrums are different, you know, different kinds of tantrums, but not, um, you know what I'm saying? I will tell you this. I have morphed this workshop so much in the last 15 years that it genuinely is good for parents of five-year-olds, 25-year-olds, boys, girls, inattentive, hyperactive, all of it because it's, it's really addressing, I know that sounds hard, but it's really addressing all of that. I see all of that within even a family anyway. And by the way, girls and women do not get diagnosed enough with ADHD. They get diagnosed with depression and anxiety. And very often ADHD is part of what, part of what should be within there. Yeah. And by the way, if any of you have follow-up questions and also um, you see my email address, I do have a newsletter. So go to my website, sign up for my newsletter. I am sending out tips and tools and strategies and research and all sorts of stuff. There's lots of support in the newsletter that you'll get. Fabulous. Yeah. And lots of really great takeaways uh, that came through in the chat box. Uh, so really good. Um, I love even just the first one. I need help. Uh, without calm, there is no learning. And a couple of comments about staying calm. Uh, hope. Uh, Science-based uh, behind the work. Let's see. Uh, the question, what relationship do you want with your child when they grow up? That's a, that's a big one. Um, no quick fixes getting to know the child better. Uh, yeah, the late diagnosis came up a few times. Girls get diagnosed less. Uh, and how important is it? Yeah, absolutely essential. So phenomenal, great stuff. Uh, we will put the recording on the YouTube channel and everyone that registered will receive a link to the recording on the YouTube channel. When I send that email out with a link, I will copy Cindy. So you will have access to her email there as well as seeing it on the screen here. That way you can reach out and connect if you want to. Uh, and then we can provide links. So Cindy's information is on obviously her website. We have it up on the Center for Coaching Certification as well. Uh, and we can share those links with you in terms of where you can learn more, both about the parent coaching, uh, the class for parents, and then also coaching. So fabulous. Other uh, thoughts or closing comments, Cindy? Uh, you're not alone. If you are parenting, you're struggling, you're not alone. Support is available for you. So reach out. Awesome. If you want awesome. to get, we need more parent coaches. We need people doing this work. <laughs> yes. As a matter of fact, I've got somebody reaching out to me asking for coaches that have training in this area. So we'll be putting that up uh, for our graduates, letting people know that that's coming. So yeah, fabulous. Thank you everyone for being here. We appreciate your time and, and participation. And Cindy, thank you so much for doing this workshop. Awesome information, as has been my experience with you every time. Uh, and we look forward to uh, people connecting and reaching out. So thank you. Thank you.